Welcome to the next video in the Patterns in Nature topic. This video will be looking at the dot point, distinguish between autotrophs and heterotrophs in terms of their nutrient requirements. So if we have a look at this image, this shows us how energy passes through an ecosystem. So we looked at this in the local ecosystem unit where we looked at the different types of energy flow throughout ecosystems from the sun into our autotrophs through the process of photosynthesis and then on to our heterotrophs and then through the um, help of the decomposers those nutrients and that energy was then recycled back into the environment for use by the autotrophs again during that process of photosynthesis. So our autotrophs include our primary producers such as our green plants and our phytoplankton so basically anything that is able to undergo photosynthesis and our heterotrophs may, are made up of our consumers, our detrivores, and our decomposers. And as we can see from the direction of the arrows, we have a one-way flow of energy through the ecosystem from the sun into the autotrophs where they convert that energy through the process of photosynthesis into chemical energy. That chemical energy is then passed on to the heterotrophs, which they then convert into mechanical energy in order to move. They also convert it into heat and sound energy. And then that energy is given off into the ecosystem. And we have that constant cycle of energy as well as a constant cycle of nutrients. So if we start off by looking at our autotrophs. So when we break down the word autotroph, we break it down into two parts. So auto simply means self and troph means feeding. So autotrophs are those organisms which are able to provide food for themselves. Uh, a term that we've used quite a bit so far this year and we have in the past is producers. So autotrophs are producers because they're able to produce their own food. They use carbon dioxide, water and the energy from the sun to carry out the process of photosynthesis. Don't forget we also need the chemical chlorophyll that we get from the chloroplast in order to carry out the process of photosynthesis. As a result of photosynthesis, gluco glucose sorry, is produced and it is used by the plant cells for cellular respiration or if it's not required for respiration for the production of energy, it is stored in starch. And it's this starch that then gets passed on into other organisms when the plants are consumed. Autotrophs also need other inorganic substances such as nitrates, phosphates and sulfates to help build biochemical uh, biochemicals, in particular proteins, which we looked at at the beginning of this topic when we looked at the important molecules and chemicals that are required for life. These substances enter most plants along with water through the root systems. So if we quickly jump back to that slide from before, we can see here that this is where those nutrients will come in. They'll come from the breakdown of uh, dead autotrophs and dead heterotrophs and then they will be drawn up into the plant via the root system. So some bacteria and some archaea bacteria, which we'll be looking at a little bit later, are also autotrophic. So they're also able to make their own food, but they obtain their energy from a process called oxidation, where they use substances such as ammonia, hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and some iron compounds in order to create the energy rather than carbon dioxide. So an example is the bacteria that support the ecosystem around hydrothermal deep sea volcanic vents. So this here is a volcanic vent deep below the ocean. And as we can see, it's in complete darkness. So obviously photosynthesis isn't going to be much help because they don't have the energy from the sun in order to um, allow the reaction to process. So what they've done is they've been able to adapt to their environment and, order, um, and are able to obtain their energy from other ways. So in particular, these type of bacteria use hydrogen sulfide, not water, to produce sulfur, not oxygen. And so hydrogen sulfide and sulfur has quite a strong smell. And as we can see from the picture there, it's quite dense in comparison to oxygen. So deep down in these deep thermal vents, it's very hot. So this process of creating energy is sufficient enough for these particular organisms in, to be able to survive down there. So we've had a look at autotrophs, so let's have a look at our heterotrophs. So when we break down the word heterotroph like we did with autotroph, hetero means different, 
Okay, so when we think of a heterosexual relationship, it's a male and a female. So heterotroph again also means feeder. So a different feeder. So therefore they require different sources of energy than those and they can provide. So we can't provide ourselves with the energy requirements that we need. So we need to get that energy from somewhere else. So a term that we've used quite a bit this year is consumer. They consume other organisms, whether they be plants or animals. Heterotrophs rely on autotrophs to provide them with the glucose required to carry out respiration. So as we know, we breathe in oxygen, but the only place that we can get glucose from is from eating other organisms. So in particular, eating lots of uh, fruit and vegetables, so plant material, provides us with the glucose that we need to carry out respiration in order to produce ATP. All animals, fungi and bacteria are heterotrophic as they cannot photosynthesize. So you recall we did mention the archaea bacteria in the last slide. So there are some bacteria that can. However, during uh, classification of organisms, when fungi started to first be identified, it believed that they it was believed that they fit into the plant group because they look very similar in structure and size to plants and not very um, common similarities between animals and fungi. But eventually once the microscope was invented and they were able to look deeper within the cells of the fungi, they found that there were no chloroplasts. So fungi aren't able to carry out the process of photosynthesis, so they need to get their uh, energy from somewhere else. So as we know, fungi are examples of decomposers, so they will break down dead material and that's where they will get their energy requirements from. And that brings us to the end of this video. So it's just a quick little recap of what the difference is between autotrophs and heterotrophs and how they deal with their energy requirements. And this is going to lead us now into looking much deeper at the process of photosynthesis. Thank you.